Hi, I'm Ben from Renew, and today we're going to learn how to play Settlers of Catan. First, you're going to grab all of your tiles, and we're going to set up the board, and then from there I'll teach you how to play. So you're going to set up the board five tiles in a row, with four on either side and three on either side of that, like so. All right, and our board is all set up. Sometimes when you set up the board, you'll have three resources. In this case, let's say mountains in a triangle like this. In those cases, you need to pick one of them and just shuffle it up a bit. Or if you're really picky, you can redeal the whole board. But we're not really picky. There we go. So the board's set up. Now we're going to put the border around it. These have the harbors on them, and they have little numbers where each of the puzzles puzzle pieces intersect. So those numbers will match up on each of these tiles. Now we're going to put the number tiles on. These number tiles are lettered on the back side. So you have numbers on one side, letters on the other side. Flip them all over to the letter side and sort them alphabetically. So we have A on the bottom of this pile and stack the whole way up through R. Now we have a stack of tiles, all in alphabetical order on the bottom side and with their numbers on top. And we're going to deal around the board, starting pick on any tile on the outside and go in either direction around the board, skipping the desert. So we're set up and ready to go, but before we start, uh, obviously you want to know what the object of the game is. The point in Settlers is to get 10 victory points. You get victory points through building things like the cities and settlements that you get, as well as indirectly, sometimes you can get points through building roads and building armies, and we'll get to all of that in a moment. So everyone that's playing with you, we're going to assume it's a four-player game, but if it's three players, just nothing really changes, except there's one less bag you'll hand out. Everyone needs to get their pieces and their matching building cost card that also has little cheats at the bottom to let you know how turns work and that sort of stuff. Blue goes with blue, red goes with red. Doesn't really matter, all the costs are the same. So at the beginning of the game, um, before we get to initial placements, I'm going to go through what a typical turn order looks like so that as you start to place you have an idea of what you're looking for. So the first thing you do on every turn is roll the dice. Roll the dice. Um, a seven is a special case, but say we roll a different number to start. Um, at the beginning of your turn, if you roll the nine, you'll notice on the board there's a couple nines here. So those are the squares that would produce resources for people built on them when a nine's rolled. After you roll the dice, you can trade with your neighbors, you can trade with the bank, and then after you finish your trading, you can build as the final step of your turn. So roll the dice, trade, and build. To start the game, everyone is going to have to open up their bags, dump all their stuff out. I'm going to be playing this as white, and we'll just go through a demo first couple turns as I explain the game. All right, you can clean the bags off the table into your box. So, to start the game, each player needs to grab out two roads and two settlements from their supply of uh, building pieces. And these are, the, are going to start on the board for you, and I'll go around placing them for each player in a moment, as your initial setup when you first arrived on Catan and began settling. So everyone will have two settlements and two roads. And placement starts, so we'll roll the dice to see who goes first. I rolled a seven. We're going to assume that seven is the highest number once everyone's rolled. And so I will place first. I place my settlements on a three-way intersection on the board. And I want to get the best odds I can. I want to be able to collect the most resources I can. So I need to be on a square that's most likely to be rolled. And the way you can tell which squares are most likely to be rolled 
are based on the number of dots below the numbers. Settlers has conveniently set up the board so that they give you those little tips. So uh, for example, this 10 has three dots underneath it, which means that it is, uh, there's a higher likelihood of a 10 being rolled than a three being rolled, for example, with two dots under it. The most common numbers are eights and sixes. So those are the numbers that you want to be placing close to if you can. So here, for example, is a great spot for me to place. Um, I've got five, four, and four dots um, on a six, a nine, and a five. And then I'll also place a road. And we're going to place it here. You need to build roads through the game to connect um, your, your network so that you can build other settlements and cities later in the game, which I will explain later as well. So now we go clockwise. So yellow is going to place next a settlement in a city. And we'll go the whole way around the board to red. And then red will place a second time and we'll go counterclockwise on the way back so that everyone gets a roughly fair placement to start the game off. So yellow will place here is another good spot. And I'm going to place these fairly quickly. So these might not be the best spots on the board, but you get the idea. The last settlement each player places, they collect the resources for when they place it. So this was Red's last settlement. He's going to get a sheep, a wheat, and a wood. All right, there's my last placement. And you may have noticed, um, I don't necessarily call these resources by the same names the game does. Um, technically, it's wheat, ore, wool, brick, and lumber. But I mostly call them sheep and wood. The other ones I think I can nail most of the time. So these are my cards. They're obviously going to be hidden from everyone else, but for the sake of this game, you're playing from my view, so I will have these out in front of me face up so you can see what I have. So this is our starting placement. Uh, next, I'm going to run through a turn in the game. So it's my turn. I have these cards. First thing I do on my turn is roll the dice. I rolled a six. So we're going to look across the board here and find all the sixes. There's, there should be two. So there's a six here on the mountains and there's a six here in the fields, which means everyone who's built on those tiles collects those resources. So in this case, I would collect one ore from the bank because I have a settlement on this mountain. Yellow would also collect an ore or orange would also collect an ore and blue would collect a wheat. Those all go in their hands. That's the end of my rolling section of my turn and now I can trade. So I'm going to look at my hand, I can look at my building cost card and see what I want to work towards building. In this case, actually, I already have everything I want to build a development card. So I'm just going to skip my trading phase. It's an optional phase of my turn. You don't have to trade. You also don't have to build, but I do want to build. So I'm going to build a development card, which costs me a wheat, a wool, and an ore. And I will grab the top development card from the pile. Development cards, in most cases, you have to wait a full turn before you can play them. But let's look and see what this card is. We've got a market. This is a building card. You can tell it's a building because it's orange on the top. Every building in the deck, all five of them, give you a free victory point when you play the card. So these ones are best normally to hold to the end of the game. And then on your last turn, reveal that you have a couple extra points and clean up, jump ahead of whoever's beating you or... or whatever the case may be. But they're also the one development card that you could play immediately. So I bought this on this turn. I could, if I wanted to, play it right away. Let's look at the rest of the development cards here. There's a whole bunch of different cards in the deck, mostly knights, and we'll get to them in a minute. But the other types of cards are all handily here at the top of the deck. 
We have the four other buildings, all different names and different illustrations, but they're all exactly the same card as far as gameplay goes. They all give you one victory point. We have these green cards. These are uh, generally free resources and um, aspects that you can build in the game. So we have a Year of Plenty. Year of Plenty is very straightforward. When I play the Year of Plenty, I can take any two cards from the bank. Um, there's a road building card. When I play a road building card, I can place two roads for free as if I had just built them. I can place them together, connected to my network, or I can place them uh, at separate settlements on opposite sides of the board, anywhere I want really. Um, let's say I got this card and placed them here. We'll come back to that in a minute. And then there's also a Monopoly card. The Monopoly card is probably one of the best cards to have and the worst cards to play against. When I play Monopoly, say I did play Monopoly here, I'll play Monopoly on wheat. That means every other player in the game has to look through their hands and give me all of their wheat. So I would get one wheat from yellow, I would get two wheat from blue, and I'd get a wheat from red. Which obviously is quite helpful to me and not so much to my opponents. All right. So that's the development cards. Next, a piece that I didn't put on the board at the beginning um, oh, is the robber. So the robber normally starts in the desert when you're setting up at the beginning of the game. And he, um, along with another card in the development deck here that we didn't go over, are very related to each other. So your development card deck has all of the cards we talked about before, as well as the knight. Um, the knight you use to scare away the robber, because throughout the course of the game, you'll notice on the board there's no sevens. So if you roll a seven, which I didn't, though that's the highest, the best odds in dice are that you would roll a seven. Most likely you will roll a seven. Um, so if I'd roll the seven, I would move the robber. And you move the robber anywhere on the board except the desert or the tile that it was on. So right now it's on the desert. Obviously, I can't move it back to there. Um, but if it had moved previously in the game, you do have to move it. You can't leave it where it was sitting. So here, I'm white. I don't want to put the robber on myself. So I'm going to find someone else here. This is a good spot. Uh, that's a better spot because it's more likely to be rolled. So I'm going to put the robber here on the 10 um, in the hills, the brick hills, um, or the clay hills for your brick production. Um, having the robber here means that whenever a 10 is rolled, this square doesn't produce any resources. So it hurts both blue and red. In addition to placing the robber here, I get to steal a card from one of their hands. I can pick the player. Um, I'm going to pick blue, and I get to steal a card from blue's hand and add it to my hand. Uh, and then for the until the robber moves, this tile doesn't produce any resources when a 10 is rolled. You just put it right over the number. It helps you remember not to collect anything on that number. Now, red or blue might have bought a development card earlier in the game, and they have this knight sitting in their hand. So when it comes to their turn, they're going to play the knight to chase away the robber. And you do exactly the same thing as you would when you roll a 7. You take the robber off the tile. You can't move it back onto the tile it started from. You can't move it to the desert, but you can put it anywhere else on the board. Some people play nice and put it off on the side, but you obviously can't steal a card from someone doing that. Um, so it's not your most beneficial play unless you're trying to make friends, which maybe you are in a board game. Um, so say they move it to a square. This is blue playing it, so they're going to move it somewhere where it's not blue. This is a great spot for blue to put the robber. And then they can steal from any player here. They can steal from me, from yellow, um, sorry, from orange, or from red. And the one other rule with the seven is, um, or with the robber, this isn't true of the knight, but when a seven's rolled and the robber's moved, uh, whoever, or ever, anyone, when a seven's rolled, you have to check your hand count, your card count. So we roll a seven. You count the number of cards in your hand. If you have more than seven cards in your hand, you have to lose half of them to the bank. So this is how the game controls hand limits and you can't just collect resources all game. You have to be spending them as you go because if you have more than seven cards in your hand and someone rolls a seven, 
you immediately lose half of them. I don't. I have six, so we're safe. Um, but just something to keep in mind. Don't, don't let your hand grow too large without buying things or trading cards to other players. Speaking of trading cards, uh, we've talked before about trading cards with other players. You can also trade cards with the bank. So the cost to trade cards with the bank, if you look at my hand here, I have four wheat and two ore, which I can't build anything with. Um, and I actually can't even trade with the bank anything here. Um, to build a card, but say I was working towards a road and so I don't want any of these resources really I want a brick. I could trade with the bank for wheat For one brick and I can do that with any resource four of the same of any resource to the bank for any one resource I want now to increase your um, Leverage in trading with the bank you could say you can build out to a harbor so if we look on the board here, I have roads down this way, which means I could build a settlement down here because my settlements have to be connected to a road when I place them. But I could play a settlement, say, right there. This means because I'm connected to this sheep harbor, I'm connected to one of the piers at the sheep harbor, I can trade two sheep for any one resource to the bank. So instead of trading four cards, I can trade two as long as they're sheep to the bank for a card. In this case, it's not helpful right now, but it could be in the future. There's also harbors like a three for one harbor. So say I build along the roads here later in the game and I can build a settlement here. I can now build or trade, sorry, three for one, three of any resource to the bank for one of any resource, a little cheaper than the four for one deal. Again, mostly in the game, it's gonna be cheapest to trade with your friends um, or enemies as the case may be. Um, because they'll give you a better deal than three for one, but occasionally they don't have what you want or they're just not willing to trade. You'll notice that earlier through the game, I've built up to five roads here. Once you hit five roads, you get the bonus of longest road. Longest road is two extra victory points and it goes to any player who gets to five roads. If you're the first player to five roads, as soon as someone surpasses you, they get to steal the longest road from you. So I have the longest road right now because I've built five roads, but let's say red comes along and ambitiously works out around the desert. For some reason, they really want to get to this back corner of the board. Not a great strategy in game, but for illustration purposes, red now has six segments to its road and I only have five. So red would steal the longest road token from me or black. Similar to longest road, there's a largest army card which also awards two victory points. And this is for uh, the largest army, whoever has the most knights from the development card deck. So we looked at knights earlier. Blue right now has one, but if they were to play at least two more knights through the course of the game, they would get the largest army bonus. And similar to the lo longest road, as long as they have more or equal to everyone else, they keep that card. As soon as someone p surpasses them, they would steal the largest army. Um, another thing we haven't gone over yet is cities. Um, to win the game, like we talked earlier, you need 10 victory points. And settlements are worth one victory point, where a city is worth two. So that alone is a good enough reason to build a city. But cities not only, so say I built a city here. Um, I'm going to build it on a square that collects really well. This is this one here. Because not only do cities give you two victory points in the place of one for your settlement, but they also collect twice the resources. So I would collect uh, now on this mountain two ore. I would collect here uh, two, sh two wool and two wood from the forest on these numbers. Obviously, I don't collect any sheep or any wool from the pasture right now because the robber's there. But uh, theoretically, when he moves, I can collect from there as well. Um, so that's pretty well the the game of settlers. Um, you, as you're going along through the game, you're collecting victory points. Uh, right now, if you look at the board, we can count up how many points I have. I've got five points, three settlements and a city. Um, remember to keep track of the plaques too though, because there's other players that are close to me here. Red has two settlements, so only two points, but an additional two points for the longest road. So they're at four points. And as the game goes along, you're gonna get more points. So a potential way for me to win here 
is to try and get one of these plaques while also building up my cities and settlements. So I could end up, as the game progresses, maybe I build around here to the three for one harbor. Now I can't place here because I'm only one space away from the, yellow, the orange settlement, but I could continue along there. I now have the longest road, so I would steal that from red. I maybe build another city somewhere along here. There's no benefit to having a city on a harbor, but it does benefit you for the, the hill and the forest that's on here. So now in the game, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine victory points. And maybe the last thing I buy here is a development card. You obviously can't sort through the deck for what you want, but for illustration, I buy this development card and now I play that card and I have 10 points and I win the game. And that's Settlers. Enjoy.